Everyone received the uh, lesson plan for today? Okay, have that handy. So I'm going to go through this. So I don't really go through it linearly. I kind of jump all over the place, but I'll check things off and make sure that I've covered everything with respect to today's lecture. So let's begin. So from your foundation class, by the way, I can turn more lights on. If this is helpful, let me know. For the board, better? Okay. So when you took the foundation class, you learned how to expose film, you learned how to process a negative, you learned how to make prints. But I wanna go back to the beginning to make sure in a 200 level class, everyone is familiar with the controllable factors to make immediate exposure. Particularly if you just took one class and then you didn't shoot photograph anymore since taking this class, then it's really important that we uh, have a refresher. And I'll go into a little bit more detail, I think, in terms of how you really can control the camera so that you can make better pictures and pictures that are inherently more unique to you. So there are three controllable factors to make a median exposure. Emphasis on median. Can anyone tell me from your experience in using a film camera when you took the foundation class, what I mean by median exposure? Raise your hand if you'd like to answer the question. If you're not sure, that's okay. I'm gonna go over it anyway. Okay. In my camera, my 35 millimeter camera, When I click down, let's put a lens on here. First, I turn my meter on. And then when I'm viewing through the camera, it will give me Okay, right now I'm at a 60th of a second at 5.6 using 400 speed film. So let's write those down. 400 ISO is my standard film that I'm using for this particular example. I'm at a 60th of a second. So this is one controllable factor. This is two controllable factors. This is the third controllable factor. Can someone tell me what that is? Raise your hand. Stop. What is it? The f-stop. Correct, f-stop. And in this case, I said the f-stop was f5.6. So in my finder to arrive at this median exposure, I have a plus, and I have a minus, and if my camera is arrived at that proper reading, it will be somewhere in between a negative and a positive. Negative, as you learn in, in film, black and white film photography, can someone tell, tell me what that implicates? What this negative, what would you, if you're looking at a black and white print? Yes, go ahead. It means it would be underexposed. That would that means it would be underexposed, correct? And what would that underexposure signify in a black and white print? It would be too dark. Correct. It would be dark. So this negative means that's the dark end of the scale or shadow area. And then the plus conversely would be 
high legs. And the middle would be all of the tonalities in between the darkest, richest, deep black to the brightest highlight. Let's say if it's a landscape, beautiful outside, outside day, clouds in the sky, then those highlights would be the white billowy clouds that you would see in the picture. So this is what we're always trying to achieve when we're making a photograph. Now I want to pivot and go back in history to a period of time when photography may have been invented. And I've given this a lot of thought, and read a lot about the history of photography. And there are in fact, class, certain key dates that denote when photography became essentially known to mankind, when photography became available to mankind all over the world, whether it be in China, whether it be in America, whether it be in, in Europe, okay? But let's try to think back on how it could have possibly evolved. So I came up with this caveman theory. So the caveman theory is this. In photography, we're always working with geometry, right? Rectangles and squares. So I make that a simple delineation of the space within the drawing of the caveman, how he may have discovered uh, the camera obscura, which is the handout that I gave you. I sent last night, there's a written description of the camera obscura. And I sent another example of being inside a darkened chamber. So just, so just imagine, here's a horizon line near a mountains, clouds. So landscape scene. And that, as you know, cavemen lived inside of caves. Generally, there would be some water nearby a stream, maybe he made a path to go out and hunt and gather. Very logical, right? That's conceivable. We all can conceive of that notion that that's how they live. Very uh, proximal to where they could get food. And they needed shelter from the elements, so they generally dug into caves and that's where they got that warm during the winter and so forth and so on. So, one day, this caveman is out searching for food, hunting and gathering to feed his, his family. Started off as a pretty nice day. Toward the evening, he started to see it was starting to get cloudy, weather was starting to take a turn for the worse. And he felt some rumblings on the ground. He was not sure what it was, but he went inside the cave, started cooking the meal. And then lo and behold, an act of nature occurred. This act of nature we refer to or know as an earthquake. Unfortunately for this poor family, the cave opening collapsed. So this cave now becomes a little pinhole, just a circular hole, maybe not perfect, but from that hole was the only reference point he had to any orientation, right, as to where the cave opening once was. So he's so obviously frightened and disoriented. So I'm the caveman looking to where the cave door once was, and I see the light coming in, look just a little bit of ray of light. I see the rays, a little bit of light shining on my face. And so he's, trying to get a sense of where the family is. So he turns completely around like this to the back of the cave. And that's when he saw this incredible act of nature, this miracle of mankind, this miracle of science, this miracle of physics, which we refer to as the camera obscura, which essentially meant that what he saw from that collapsed opening in the cave was the act of a camera obscura of light 
coming through that opening, which in photography we refer to this opening as what? Think of your three controllable factors. What does this hole in the cave that's letting light in become? A stop. 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 Correct. An aperture. This essentially becomes an aperture where light can pass through the opening in the cave into the darkened chamber. What are some other terminologies that we use is the part of the nomenclature of photography that aperture also means? Well, you said it, Rachel, f-stop. I wanna go over these because when you read Naomi Rosenblum's history of world history of photography, she referred to this phenomenon in four different ways. So we have f-stop, aperture, can anyone name the other two? They're a little less familiar, but you know, I've been around photography for four decades, so I, I'm familiar with them all. So the other two are iris and diaphragm. These are the types of questions that I'll ask on an exam. Okay, so I want you to know these backward and forward. F-stop, aperture, iris, and diaphragm. So this is foundational historically to how photography evolved over time. So after this discovery occurred, thousands and thousands and thousands, millions of years of time, I suppose, scientists started to experiment during the uh, Renaissance, going back to 1500, 1600, they started to experiment with light sensitive chemicals. One of the chemicals was silver bromide, silver nitrate. And these are the light sensitive chemicals that make up photographic film and paper to this day. So let's look at some of the most fundamental cameras that evolved over time. This essentially is the darkened chamber and it's called a pinhole camera. You may have studied it or learned about it in your foundations class. But this pinhole camera example really solidifies how photography evolved from an ancient idea of just the camera obscura, but no way to really affix an image permanently on a surface. So the way you make a pinhole camera, this is just a shoe box. I made sure all the edges were nice and tight. And then I made the uh, flap where I could it, put an exposed piece of paper in it if I wanted to make a picture, punched a hole in it and just had a piece of cardboard cover the hole so that this becomes your shutter. Before there were shutter speeds, you just had a like a, a lens cap over the lens when lenses started to develop and evolve to um, prevent light from going in until the time you wanted it to go in. So I make an exposure for a period of time. Now keep in mind in the old days, let's say in the 1900s, it would take minutes to make an exposure, literally minutes because the light sensitive chemicals weren't strong enough. They didn't mix the chemicals strong enough or whatever. The lenses were very primitive. They were, uh, when we get into lenses, you'll understand what the difference is between a fast lens and a slow lens. But as long as you are keeping the flap over the pinhole, you're making an exposure. So when that exposure is finished, you can see the camera obscura, it would have, would have observed what was outside of the lens that it saw outside of the darkened chamber, but it would be upside down and backwards. Does everyone now have a clear picture of the evolution of this medium that way? Okay, now let's take this a little bit further. With this handout, the cycle POCO number five from Rochester, 
hammer manufacturing. This was invented around 1905, I think 1895, yeah, 1895 through 1905. This was one of the first mass produced hammers. And what you can see, I have a, an old one that doesn't work anymore, but it was a beautifully designed uh, wooden. There was a handle up here where you could carry it about. This actually is called a, this is a, called a bellows. You may have learned about bellows in uh, foundation photography. The bellows allows the photographer to focus by moving the bellows forward or backwards, depending on the amount of space or, or inches or feet between the lens and the subject. This would allow the photographer to focus. And then as lenses got more sophisticated, there were focusing rings on the lens itself. So light passes through, goes through the bellows, which is the darkened chamber, and film would go in the back so that the photographer could make an exposure. Uh, this is an example of a film bag. You may have seen this also when you studied foundation. You would go into the dark room, you'd pull the sleeve out, and you can see that gray is actually, uh, would have been unexposed film, but it's actually a, exposed now, so it's no good. I want, just wanted you to get, remind yourselves of the physical example of how larger format cameras in, in this day and time were to make exposure. So this would slip in the back like so. Pull the slide out, take the picture, close it, take the exposed film to the uh, photo lab, and then you would start making your negatives. So this is the, Poco, very, very popular camera. I think they sold it for like $10 back in you know, 1895. And this actually collapses so that the bellows goes inside the box. Like so and then you could transport it wherever you were traveling. It was an incredible invention during the early days. Now let's get into some more modern cameras. This is the same camera that you just looked at, uh -huh. but a modern version. Now we have these here at, at school. This happens to be my, my personal camera. And for your, when you get into your, not the first assignment, but the second assignment, third assignment, which is your individual project, you may want to work with a large format camera and there are advantages and disadvantages to that, which we'll get into shortly. But basically the same, uh, design is in play here with the exception of two, two very important things. With this modern camera, it has the functionality of a phenomena that we call swings and tilts and a third rises. So let's say I'm setting up my camera on Broad Street and I wanna take a picture of City Hall. I'm at Broad and Walnut, that's where I, that's where I think I have the best view. And you can imagine if you're shooting with a 35 millimeter camera, two, you, there's a difference between the 35 and the four by five. The four by five is going to render a much larger negative, right? Larger negative means more detail, incredibly much more detail because it has a much larger film plane to capture the light. But this also has a second advantage in that You've all taken pictures where you're trying to get an entire structure in the, in the frame, but invariably you have to tilt the camera up to get the top of the building. And that causes a phenomenon called keystoning. It's a form of lens distortion where parallel lines 
that the brain observes start to converge like that. That's the parallax problem of photography. It's also a, a physics problem that scientists figured a way to get around by using and designing and embedding a four by five. So how did they do it? Well, if you look carefully as I'm racking this, let me raise it a little more so you can see better. There. Okay, so on a view camera, you have film plane, lens plane, lens, adjustable back, not adjustable, back that you could open up so you can slip your film in. But there's a knob here on the rail. This is called the monorail that supports the, the front lens board to the rear lens board. And it's, it, it has an adjustment where you can see the film plane going up, right? Or you can lower the film plane. So in architectural photography, usually uh, architects will hire photographers who are experts in operating a view camera because they never wanna see their buildings misrepresented in a picture. In other words, they wanna see <clears throat> parallel lines be parallel, horizontal lines be horizontal and so forth. So if you are shooting a building, you can raise the front lens board. And what that does, when you see that angular look of the camera, that means that the front lens board is starting to see the top of the building, right? Because it's moving up, but the rear, rear board, the film board is not moving. That's how you make adjustments and perspective control corrections that you cannot achieve with 35 millimeter unless you have special lenses, which I'm gonna go over in a little bit. Two and a quarter, no. No way you're gonna get the same kind of perspective control as you can with a view camera. It also has swings and tilts. Swings that you just turn a little latch on the front lens plane and it will swing the lens to the right. You can start to see it coming around here, or you could swing it the opposite way. And by studying the different uh, movements of a view camera, photographers have invented very unique bodies of work based on the science that is inherently unique to the view camera. So at this 200 level, what I'm trying to instill in you is a way to understand all the mechanics of photography to arrive at a unique approach to creating a unique body of work by knowing all the things that a camera can do. Uh, the last uh, advantage that a view camera has, and that's with respect to depth of field, which is a term, God, God bless you, uh, which is a term that you learned about in foundation, okay? Depth of field simply means how much sharpness you have in a picture from the foreground of it to the infinity point, right? And different lens and different f-stop combinations reveal either shallow depth of field or an enhanced depth of field depending on the lens selection that you use. But this camera also has a tilting function which means you can tilt the lens board downward on a 45 degree angle or more. You can see how it's now no longer parallel to the rear lens board. And the phenomenon that takes place here, when you tilt that lens board, it actually creates more depth of field. Okay, it creates more depth of field when you tilt the lens board. And again, if you elect to get into view camera photography for your individual project. Either I or Dan can go over this with you. You can use one of the school's cameras. Okay, there's a question, Sharon. Yeah, I'm just wondering, can you like change the aperture of a view camera or is it like fixed? Because okay. I think for like depth of field, you can also change your like aperture. Great, that's a, that's a great uh, question. In the beginning, back in the, 19th century, when the evolution of the view camera started to take hold, 
No, the lenses were fixed, okay? Uh, they could have been at F32, or they, were, they weren't very fast in the beginning, let's put it that way. So, but over time, they were, the lenses and the lens boards were designed just like regular camera lens boards. So this has f-stops ranging from 5.6 all the way down to 45. It also has shutter speeds available on it from bulb. B for bulb means you can click the shutter open and keep it open for an extended period of time, right? You learn that in foundations, or you can set actual preset shutter speeds from one second all the way up to a 400 of a second. So this has all the functionality of any camera that you've used. Mainly everyone's probably used 35 millimeter. Same functionality. The only difference is it's still. You can't take action. I mean, you could take action shots if you, you know, were really clever because if it's on a tripod, you can can with it. You know, you can do some creative things with it, but it's not really mobile. It's meant to be a very patient exercise in maximizing perspective control and detail. One of the other advantages it has is that these lens boards come off, okay? They, and you, you, can, you can install different size lenses. Now, this happens to be a Schneider. This is my standard lens. It's a 210 millimeter. Now, 35 millimeter terms, that would be considered long, but the proportionality of lens design for four by five is different than a 35 or a two and a quarter format. So this is a 210 millimeter, which is considered normal, like it would be great for portrait photography or any virtually any kind of photography. It's just not a wide angle lens. So if you're shooting a big wide scene, you want to go down to, you know, maybe a 50 millimeter lens if you're working with a a four by five. And also, this rear viewing screen comes off. So this, this viewing screen, you can see my hand through it, has a matte surface to it, and it has a grid on the back. Okay, the grid on the back, there's grid lines, which you may not be able to see are for architectural photographers to line up parallel lines, horizontal and vertical lines that make th sure things when you're playing with the front lens board, things line up exactly the way you want them to. So these are interchangeable. Uh, I even have a customized version. This blows up and makes the image even brighter. This is a, an accessory that you can get to add to your view camera system. Um, this actually magnifies the light. You can see it has like a magnifying quality, which makes, makes it easier to view um, when you're setting up a shot. The, the drawbacks for view cameras, of course, is that the lenses are slow. And you've all seen... Photographers use a black cloth. They put it over the, the negative side, film plane, they get underneath and look to frame the shot. Because remember, when you, the lens limits the brightness. Lens limits the brightness. If it's a 5.6, you learn from foundation that that's a slow lens. Means that it's not that bright to view through because it's not allowing that much light in the camera. If, I, if it were a 3.5, it would be brighter. If it were an F2, it would be even brighter still. But so photographers customarily have to use some kind of shade so that they can block all the extraneous light that would prevent them from seeing on the back of the ground glass. This is called a ground glass, okay? So if any of you are interested in pursuing uh, use of the view camera for your individual project or even perhaps assignment two, I will um, give you a private instruction or that on that or we can have Dan do that, okay?
So we've gone over pinhole, we've gone over the early Fox camera, and now I'm gonna introduce you to the medium format. So there's essentially really four formats that are available to contemporary photographers, right? You've got 35, you've got medium format, and you've got four by five and eight by 10. So we also have an eight by 10 camera. The eight by 10 camera is the preferred camera for photographers who enjoy the most maximum detail any kind of photograph can render. I would argue, having seen so many photographs throughout my career, that the eight by 10 film camera is unmatched in terms of the detail that it can render. There's no 30, there's no digital camera I don't care how much money you spend for it. I don't care how many megapixels it has. It has yet to rival the clarity and detail of an eight by 10. So you may also want to enjoy experimenting with the eight by 10 for your individual project. I, I think we have one that's in the studio in Parker House. Okay, so medium format cameras. This is called the Hasselblad. This is the workhorse for most pro photographers. There are many other or several other popular medium format cameras. Uh, I grew up on the notion that the Hasselblad was the best because it is the best in my opinion. Uh, it's a fully mechanical camera, meaning there's no computer chips in it. It's all manual. And that's what makes it a stalwart for photographers because uh, of it, the way it's designed and the way it's made. It's a Swiss camera with Swiss lenses, uh, Zeiss uh, uh, lenses. And I always had two of them at hand. One is a backup if I'm gonna shoot and uh, camera jams, which can happen uh, with, with Hasselblad if you don't know how to use them properly. So uh, this, this particular body doesn't have a lens on it, obviously. It only has the film back. So I'll show you what the, what the basic body looks like without the film back on it. So it's just a little camera obscura, right? Going right back to what we just discussed, just a little box where you have to control somehow how the light enters it from one side. Film back goes, hitches onto the back, like so. And now what makes this camera different than this camera is that this is the traditional viewfinder. It's the viewfinder where you have to look down through the prism. Now the difference between this and the other Hasselblad is when I'm looking down through a prism like this, I'm seeing the image upside down and backwards because there's no mirrors in the finder. This is called the viewfinder that the mirrors actually bounce the light around so that you can see through your cameras normally. That's, that's why you're not seeing it, anything upside down and backwards. By the way, the four by five, you see everything upside down and backwards. So it's an incredibly complicated camera to learn, but the results are amazing. There are some um, accessories that I, I know are available. This particular camera is the Sinar. It's one of the most heralded uh, four by fives and the most expensive. And Sinar actually made uh, a mechanism so that it, you know, went attached on the, on the negative plane where it would invert the image somehow. I never invested in it because I got used to looking at the images upside down and backwards. So I prefer when I use uh, my Hasselblad to see the image right side up like you can with a 35. So, I spent extra money to get what's called a sports finder. That's what this finder is on top. See that? So I view through here just like you would a 35. And because I'm shooting fashion, I'm shooting a lot of people, I'm not really creating architectural shots, although you can provide it that you don't have a parallax issue. You don't want to be tilting the camera up like this. Then I would revert to using this camera because it does have <clears throat> amazing lenses and amazing sharpness and, and amazing reliability. Uh, this is the camera that man took on the moon back in the uh, 60s. 
because they did a lot of research on camera functionality and they tested it at NASA and they found that this camera worked in, in the most extreme conditions uh, when they did the lunar landing. So any of the moon shots that you saw from the uh, 60s were taken with a Hasselblad camera, which made it the most popular medium format camera for generations. Uh, you might be wondering why there's this bellows on the front of the lens rather than in the middle, like the four by five. Can anyone render a guess as to why I had the bellows over the front of the lens? Okay, so one term that we can use for this bellows when it's on the front is a compendium, okay? Compendium and bellows are interchangeable when you see it on the front. And what that means is, it's adjustable. So if I'm using an 80 millimeter lens, there's a little adjustment I can make a slide where I can make it smaller or bigger depending on the lens because what it does class is it prevents any stray light from coming in while you're making an exposure that causes flare because these four by these two and a quarter lenses are not deeply recessed. The, front lens glass is close to the edge of the design of the lens. And when you have a, a lens design like that, they're prone to getting flare. So Hasselblad invented this bellows attachment or compendium that attaches to the front of the, um, of the lens. So in this case, the normal lens for a medium format, and I believe we actually have some medium format cameras that. Uh, Dan Burns can loan you if you want to uh, choose to play with a medium format. This is an 80 millimeter lens. I shoot a lot with a 50 millimeter lens, which looks like this. And just to give you an idea of what I mean by the lens being very close to the front, you can see it here. It's like right there, right? So without any protection, depending on the situation, I could pick up some lens flare. So this is a 50 millimeter lens. Uh, it ranges from, F4 to 22, so it's not a particularly fast lens. Um, the 80 is a little bit faster in that it's a 2.8. And then my third lens for two and a quarter is the one, 50, and that goes from F4 to F32. So I use three lenses for medium format. There are many, many other lenses, but each lens, I hate to say it, they're like $2,000 a piece nowadays, I imagine. They're very, very expensive. So I, I made sure I bought only what I needed and I didn't make a mistake in that because I've never been on a shoot where I wished I had some other kind of lens. So that's pretty much how the two and a quarter works. Now I will uh, say, and you've probably been thinking about this, when you're out in the field shooting film, there's a major drawback. And that is you have to have those controllable factors uh, perfected to get processable film. And if you don't, you go back to the lab, a day will go by, you get your results back. You probably all experienced it in foundation and there's nothing on it. It's either overexposed or underexposed, right? So what they did, well, what Hasselblad did was they invented a back. Let me use this camera to show you. If I take my film back off, this is actually a Polaroid back that was customized by Hasselblad to get around that problem. So this attaches on the back like so. The Polaroid film gets loaded in here, close the back. You take a reading with a light meter because Hasselblad's and four by five cameras do not, do not have built-in light meters. So in foundations, uh, Professor Williams may have taught you what the handheld meter is, which is a handheld device where you set your ISO 
Uh, you can set your designated uh, shutter speed or aperture, and then it would give you that median exposure. Then you would take your shot. If you didn't have a meter, a handheld meter, then you would take Polaroid tests. And then Polaroid would help you arrive at your median exposure. And then you would take your Polaroid back off, put your film back on, then you're ready to shoot. Four by fives also have a Polaroid back as well. So that's how they've gotten around, you know, that's how they've helped photographers before digital come back with printable results. But now we're gonna get into the nuancing of how to not make a mistake with exposure. Are there any questions at this point before we get in the next phase? Okay, now we're gonna to jump to the workhorse of most amateurs and professionals around the world. And that's the invention of the 35 millimeter camera called an SLR in analog photography. In digital photography, we call it a DSLR, meaning digital SLR. So this camera has, this is a Nikon F3. Again, like my Hasselblad, I always carry two with me just in case one breaks. What makes this camera a little bit different than the standard 35 millimeter camera is you'll notice that it has a, an extended back. Uh, this is called the motor drive, it takes uh, eight AA batteries to drive the film from the exposure reel to the take up reel. And a lot of professional photographers like to shoot fast if they're working with sports or any moving subject. I shoot a lot of fashion, so it comes in handy for that purpose. So that's what this is. Uh, the prism on the top, this is the light prism, is what enables me to view, view the camera and see things normally, right? Like you do when you use your cell phone, but it doesn't have a prism. And it's not as sophisticated as this because these prisms actually come off and you can change the focusing mechanism, the type of focusing uh, glass that is in the camera. Other cameras have a fixed focusing glass. It's either a split level finder or a general, you know, you, fo you, you turn the focusing ring and if it looks sharp, then it's sharp. So this one is a split level finder. It's a little bit more accurate than just a regular uh, focusing glass. It has a, it's kind of designed. This is my focusing glass when I'm looking in my prism. There's a circle in the middle. And this circle in the middle is brighter than what I'm able to see on the outside, which is an advantage, because remember, you're always shooting at the um, slowest f-stop. And some, some of these focusing glasses have a line that goes through it like that, or like this, a crosshair, so that if there's any vertical lines in the shot, if it's out of focus, the vertical line of the building, for example, would look like that. And then you rack your brain until those lines were parallel. 
So there's all kinds of different ways to focus with um, these prisms. So what does the body control? Can someone tell me what the body of a 35 millimeter camera control? You've taken a foundation class, so you should know this rudimentary question. Out of the three controllable factors, can someone name what the body controls? Rachel. The ISO. Correct. So for, in my camera, the ISO um, ring is on the left side. On, uh, it's on the film side where you load the film. And I just pull up on it. I dial it in. That's the first thing we do when we take a shot. Why? Because the ISO determines the look of your series of pictures. So I want my, all of my students to work that way. When you pick that camera up or you work on your project, I want everything to be consistent. That doesn't mean in assignment one, uh, you can choose, let's say, 100 ISO. Assignment two, you might go to 400. Assignment three, you might want to experiment with uh, high speed ISO. I just don't want you mixing them because you will never see a professional body work that has mixed messages. And ISO gives the viewer of your work a message. The message is how you want your pictures to be perceived. So the first thing I do is set the ISO. If you don't set the ISO correctly, for example, if I have 400 speed film, I open my film back, Right now I got P3200 in here. This is a high speed ISO film. So I've got 3200 ISO in the, in the camera. And I um, accidentally set the ISO on the dial to 1600. What does that mean? What will happen class for every shot that I make with that mistake. It'll be too dark. Correct, because I set the camera one stop on the negative side than it was supposed to be. If on the other hand, I set the ISO at 6,400, then what would happen? Too bright. Correct. If now I'm letting in too much light too quickly and I've overexposed the film. So setting that up accurately is, is, is key to success moving forward. So, okay, so now everyone I, I can feel it has a good understanding of the importance and the functionality of ISO. What else on the body of the camera can I do to control the controllable factors? What other functionality does it have? Controllable factors. You can change the f-stop. Oh, sorry. Think about it. The shutter speed? Correct. You can change the shutter speed. So on this camera, shutter speed dial, is right next to my shutter button. And on my camera, and all every camera is a little bit different, but generally I can go from one second to eight seconds as a dial. Then I have my B function, which means I can press down on the shutter and keep it open as long as I want, especially if you're doing like night photography. You might want to capture the stars at night. That's when photographers start to use higher ISO films and bulb. So if you want to do a one minute or two minute exposure, that's how you would do that. This camera also has an A for automatic, where it takes an average. Once you've set your ISO, it takes an average of your shutter and your f-stop calculation when the meter's on, and that will automatically adjust everything for you. I don't recommend using that a, uh, auto, automatic function at this level 
because I want you to learn how to control those controllable factors at a 200 level uh, course. Okay, so it, then it goes from a half second all the way up to one two thousandth of a second. Some of the more modern cameras, some of the DSLRs go up much higher than that, 4,000, 8,000. Uh, so that, that's the part, so we've got the back, again, ISO, shutter speed, and then lens, F-stops are always, with 35s anyway, controllable on the lens itself, okay? Now, is everyone clear on properly loading film? Did, it, did, did anyone have a problem in foundation or may have a problem now in loading film? There's two ways to load film with a 35. Some 35 millimeter cameras have auto loading, meaning I tried to catch it before it spooled all the way in. But what I, what I was going to try to show you is that when you load the film, you pull the leader out. And generally, most cameras, there's like a little slot on the take-up side, right? You all have experience with that. Slide the film in the take-up side, and then you click the shutter and advance it, right? But some, some have auto load. So once the film goes across a sensor, there's a sensor somewhere here on the take-up side. All you have to do is close the back and you'll hear it advance to the first frame. So that's an interesting feature if you, you know, you're um, looking to buy uh, uh, an extra camera or whatever. I'm sure everybody has their cameras by now, I hope. Um, and let's, let's take a quick pause. Does everybody have their cameras? Uh, starting with uh, Abby. Um, my parents are sending it now to me. Um, do, you know what you, do you know what you're getting? Yeah. Um, hold on, I wrote it down. Um, it's a Canon AE-1. Oh, AE-1. Yeah, that, that's, that's a workhorse from Canon. That's been around a long time. Yeah, it was my, it was my dad's. So. Yeah, so, so if I remember, the AE-1, and he probably may have told you, it has interchangeable lenses, right? Mm -hmm. And you probably have a 50 millimeter lens on it. Did he tell you what lens, 50? I think it, he, they're sending both, I'm getting two. Okay, so you'll bring it into class next week and then mm -hmm. we can go over any little nuance that I may be familiar with or any question you may have when you actually have it in your hand. Okay, next, Rachel, what uh, camera are you using? Um, I borrowed it from the department. Okay, oh, let's say, oh, Nicromat, yeah, that's another, Great old school, fully mechanical. Yeah, that's that's the camera that came out before this one. The Nicromat was the first professional, well, one of the first professional cameras by Nikon, uh, heavily produced because of its reliability. What what lens do you have on yours, Rachel? Um, 50 millimeter? Yeah, 50 millimeter, okay, good. And does that have an interchangeable finder? Probably not. Does that finder come off? Um, I don't think so. Okay, so if it does, it would probably have a couple. Of, can you just raise it up? Let me see. Uh, let me see the side and the back and the top. It looks to me like it has a fixed finder, which is a disadvantage. That's why they started to design these bodies because like I said, photographers like to have inside that finder or the focus is the focusing glass and the focusing glass on this is interchangeable. You can get a brighter one, split level, like I showed you. Uh, you can get the ones with grids in it for architectural photography, uh, but that's good. You got a good camera there. Okay, how about you, uh, Aliana? Um, I have the Nikon N50. Let's see. Okay. Okay. So this is a this is a relatively new film camera. 
Now, do you know what that device is on the top of your finder? That metal, that metal. Oh, this? Yep. This for flash? Correct. Now, just, just a quick quiz question. If you were to use the, uh, do you have a flash attachment for it? I don't. Okay. Um, do you know anything about flash yet? Do you um, know what the sync speed for flash is? No. Okay, we'll get, we'll get to that shortly. Uh, show me the camera one more time. Now that has a really interesting grip. So that has a motor drive, huh? Yes. That's motorized. So, oh, that's that's cool. So it probably shoots three or four frames per second, something like that. Do you have a manual for it? Um, no. You might want to download it so you can figure out how to take advantage of that motor drive. And okay. have you changed the batteries on it yet? Uh, yeah, I put in new batteries but it was like a year ago. Okay, so you, you, you might usually, like with my motor drive, when I put fresh batteries in it, you can see these red, you see those red lights light up? That mm -hmm. gives me an indication of how fresh the batteries are, because the last thing you want to be is on a shoot and you have no batteries and now you're, you got a problem. But that's a great camera. Okay, Sharon, how about you? What are you using? Um, I'm using a Nikon FE2. 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 Yeah. Okay, yeah, that's also yeah. a newer model camera. It looks like you have a uh, some kind of filter on your lens. Can you tell the class what that filter? Oh, that's the cap. Okay, take the uh, cap that's off. That's just a cap. Yeah, take, take the cap off. That's great. I'm seeing you guys taking care of your cameras. Uh, and what's the speed on this lens? What's the fastest F number? Do you know that yet? Uh, it's the 4,000, uh, one over 4,000. That, that the would, fastest shutter speed. That would be shutter speed. What, do yeah. you know your, your F number, the fastest F number? Look on uh, it. Yes, it's from 1.4 to 16. Fabulous. 1.4 class is the fastest lens you can get. So when she's looking through that lens as compared to some of the other lenses that aren't 1.4, she's got, got has a really bright finder. Now you can imagine if you're shooting in low light, that comes in really handy because it's easier to see through it, right? So that, that's one of the reasons why we want faster lenses. Now on that note, now that I'm familiar, pretty much familiar with what everyone has, we can get a little bit more into Okay, we're going to start with lenses. So I, what I have mounted on my Nikon right now is a 3.5 20 millimeter lens. That means when I'm viewing through it, I'm seeing super wide. Now, when I say super wide, I mean wider than your normal field of vision, okay? As you get wider and wider, can anyone tell me what happens to lens optics if they get if it gets too wide, what's the term that we use for a lens that is super, super wide? What happens? Fish. Eye. Yes, go ahead and say it. Go ahead. Fish eye. You get fish eye, right. So on the edges of the frame, left and right, you get incredible uh, converging perspectives, right, on the edges. I don't know if fish see that way, but the, the term fisheye is, a, uh, is the term that we use when you're using a super, super wide angle lens. Uh, I never had a use for fisheye lenses. You can actually buy them. Some photographers have taken bodies of work. Uh, one of the photographers that comes to mind, I think his name was 
this was back in the 90s. He really became famous. His name was Chip Simons. Can anyone quick Google Chip Simons to see if my memory serves me? Cindy, maybe you could look it up. Uh, Chip Simons became famous for uh, photographing dogs, animals uh, with a fisheye lens. Did that come up, Cindy? Yeah, hey, my memory served me well. So th this is a really important point because as you become more, um, as you become more knowledgeable class about the nuances, shutter speed, nuances of f-stop, nuances of ISO, nuances of formats of cameras, that's the toolbox that artists use to become unique artists. Follow me, that's so foundational. What I'm, especially at 200, that's why I wanna, so you're like vaguely familiar with this, I can tell from foundation, vaguely. But the reason why we call it foundation is I always refer this characterization to architecture. If I, if I wanna hire an architect and he says, look, Tony, I got this beautiful building and it's gonna have glass and it's gonna go up a hundred stories. And I'm gonna say, well, how did you build the foundation? And they're like scratching their head. And he says, foundation, I don't know nothing about foundation. Would you hire that architect? Same thing with photographers. Photographers or painters or sculptors must know the history and foundation by which they've come to know this medium. Okay, so 20 millimeters, super wide. So that's a 3.5. This is considered a slow lens. Not terribly slow, but it's slow. Meaning if you're currently using a 3.5, you're gonna really need to be careful of how you focus your, your shots, especially if you're working in low light at 3.5, it's a little hard to see through the finder at 3.5. X lens, that I use, which is an amazing lens. You'll appreciate this from our discussion a while earlier when we were looking at the view camera. So I bought this lens because in the early days of my career, like in the late eighties and early nineties, I did a lot of architectural photography. In fact, if you go into Philadelphia and you see our tallest building, Liberty Place, I was the art a photographer of record when that was built by Willard Rouse, who was the developer. And Willard hired me to uh, shoot the, the finished product, product, essentially. And I went all over the country shooting a lot of different buildings and projects that he worked on, uh, was called Rouse and Associates. And I got tired of lugging my <laughs> four by five around, especially on you know, a plane and cargo, I'm worrying about it getting stolen. So I went into the camera store one day and. Uh, my camera supply guy said, Tony, why don't you try out this 28 PC? You might want to jot that down so you just know what PC means in 35 millimeter terms, perspective control. So per perspective control means that when I attach this to my body, you can see that it has a little knob here. So I can literally raise See that, how I just raised my lens up the way a four by five can raise its front lens up. And that enables me to limit keystoning or the parallax problem when shooting architects. Great lens for that purpose. This is 28 PC. perspective control. And this lens is also 3.5, slow. Next lens. Next lens is a 35 millimeter, 
35 millimeter 1.4 is considered wide, like the 28 and the 20, but it's, it's starting to get closer in view to the normal lens, okay? So some people consider it the, the end stage of, of wide and the beginning stage of normal. This is a workhorse because there's very little distortion when you're holding the camera properly, meaning you're not, you know, you're not tilting the, uh, the camera up if you're shooting a building. But if you're working with people and basic scenes that don't require the rigidness of framing uh, re uh, rectilinear lines, this is a great lens for that. It's also very fast. Fastest one that I have in my camera bag is the 1.4 and it's the fastest lens that's available. Okay, now we get into the normal realm. So this is the lens that all of you are working with right now, except there's one difference. I have not a 50 millimeter lens, I have a 55 millimeter macro lens. Can anyone tell me what it means by the term macro? What does macro mean? Means large or like too large. It actually means I can shoot small close close ups. So if I put this lens on. By the way, what we are using these days, it's called a bayonet mount. Enables you to take the lens on and off real quickly. Some of the earlier lenses were called, they were literally screw mounts. You just screwed it in, which made it very slow. And photographers like, you know, like some of them like to work real fast. So the bayonet mount was invented for that purpose. So if you're looking at your, your lens, you're gonna see these numbers all these numbers here, they give you the range of settings that are available to you when you're shooting and aiming to get a maximum of depth of field. So if you read up on uh, terminology that we refer to as the hyperfocal distance, that, that'll give you some understanding of what we mean by maximizing depth of field. Every lens has a sweet spot for which it will maximize depth, covering sharpness in terms of the depth, if that's what you're trying to achieve. So with the 55 macro, this means that I can focus, let's say I wanna focus this, focus on this camera, on this lens. That's how close I can get. I can get this lens in sharpness. I actually fill the whole width of the lens in my full frame. Try that with your 50 millimeter normal lens. You're gonna be like this. So this, this gives you an understanding of what we mean by macro, okay? This comes in handy when you're shooting I've shot a lot of jewelry for jewelers over the years where they want to get photographs of rings, watches, um, collectibles, things of that nature. Very good for that, that purpose. You could do a whole series of macro photographs of plants and animals, all kinds of wonderful uh, opportunities when you get into macro uh, functionality.
Next land. Fifty-five macro. This is also pretty slow. Also a three point five. Now keep in mind when photographers, pro photographers, are out shopping for these lenses, and let's say they're. They're uh, working with Nikon, they're exclusively interested in Nikon. They will often ask their suppliers, what's the fastest lenses in these groups? And sometimes you can get, uh, I don't know if they make a 28 PC that's F2 or, or 1.4 these days, but they may. Uh, but I can guarantee you, if you get the faster version of this, it'll probably double the cost of the lens. That's why. I, I mastered the controllable factor, so I didn't have to spend as much money on lenses. I could invest in other things that I needed for my profession. And I learned to work with slow lenses because I, I mastered what I'm trying to teach you now. Okay. Next lens up. So that 50 or 55 macro is considered a normal lens. That's why most, if not all of you have normal lenses on your cameras right now. Uh, 85 millimeter lens, this is a portrait lens. This is considered to be ideal for portraiture. Why? Because when you shoot the human body, particularly heads at, at the appropriate distance, this will render the most perfect proportions. In other words, it won't be distorted at all. So that's always the, the key when you're making a portrait is to make sure that there's no lens distortion. So that's why we use an 85 millimeter. Uh, it's best for that purpose. And this lens is a 1.8. So it's a little bit slower than the 1.4, but it's, it's considered a fast lens. So this is why, this is why, this is why, this is normal. This I call portrait. Another great lens in the portrait category is the 105. Photographers love the 105 millimeter, especially if they're working with portraiture. Uh, this one is a 2.5, so it's pretty fast it's not super fast but it's it's a it's it's a stop brighter than the 3.5 85 105 these are great portrait lenses and then the longest lens in my toolkit is the 180 millimeter man is this a great lens and it's fast too This one is 2.8. This is considered a telephoto, telephoto lens. That means it sees things from afar, makes them bigger in the finder. And within these groups, from wide to normal portrait to telephoto is what photographers, one of the controllable factors that they try to master is the choice of lens because the choice of lens gives a photographer a certain look. For example, just like I mentioned Chip Simons, who was the, became famous for shooting uh, animals with a fish eye. Look up uh, Cindy, Peter Lindbergh, L-I-N-D-B-E-R-G. Peter Lindbergh was a famous German fashion photographer who was internationally known for his fashion work. And Peter exclusively worked with 180 millimeter lenses and up. Peter Lindbergh, that's what gave him his, his distinction amongst a, mil, a million other fashion photographers. 
So, so these are important points that I want to relay as you start to learn how to craft your images, but also how to craft what we call a photographic style. Okay, you guys got that? Now, while we're on the subject of lenses, let's go over, we've been throwing out these numbers, so let's just go over the classic f-stops. I want you to know these classic F numbers backwards and forwards. So Eight, eleven. So these are F numbers. Eleven, sixteen, twenty-two, thirty-two, forty-five, sixty-four. Does anyone know the last number? 90. Classic F numbers. Now, what makes these numbers relate in terms of creating a median exposure is that these are all based on a factor of two. So optically, what that means is when you go from 1.4 to 1.8, 1.8 to 1.2, and down the road, that means that as you go up higher in the numbers, followed by the preceding one, it's twice as dark or twice as light. Factor of two, two times. There's some argument in this area, 1.4, 1.8, 1.2, where it's not optically, scientifically, a factor of two. But as you start to get at the two all the way through, it's, it really is a factor of two. Just so you know, if you're working on the lower end of the exposure scale and you think, you know, you stop down one half or one full stop from 1.8 to 1.4, it might not be quite a, as twice as, as light going from 1.8 to 1.4. You might not be letting it twice as much light here, but up as you go further up, yeah, if the science gets much more accurate, 64 to 90, one stop difference. It's important to know this because it, it, it factors into how you make immediate exposure. So here's an example. First, let's go over it again. We, we determine for our assignment what our ISO is going to be. So let's say we're going to work with an ISO of 100. Then I'm going to determine, because I didn't bring my tripod to this shoot, I'm going to now prefix my shutter speed. So I'm going to select F uh, shutter speed of a 60th of a second. 60th of a second, when you look at your camera, you look on your shutter dial, you're going to see a distinction. It's going to be a red or a color or something that you'll see on the shutter dial that it, it mine it was red, right? What that means, it means two things. One, 60th of a second is flash thing. I think I had in my uh, 
my syllabus to look at uh, uh, Professor um, Edgar, Harold Egerton. He was an MIT scientist that invented the modern flash. If you haven't looked at that, review it, you know, when you do some studying from your readings and so forth. He invented the flash photography. And he found that at a 60th of a second, that would sync up with shutter and the modern cameras that were being made, let's say from 1930 forward. So 60th of a second is very important. Now, here's something that I also want you to know. It's only relevant to the type of shutter you're using. Can anyone tell me from your readings, you should be reading Stone, London, and Upton now, what the type of shutter you're using in your SLR. Can anyone tell me from your readings? Oh, not glad you're not getting the test today, right? Focal plane. You're using a focal plane shutter. That means that the shutter goes across the film plane at a rate of speed of the 60th of a second. That shutter is going to open and close in a 60th of a second. If you're using a focal plane shutter and you set your shutter speed dial to 125th of a second, that means it's going to open and close so fast that the flash the light from the flash is going to photograph the shutter. So if the light from the flash photographs the shutter, that means when you look at your negatives, you're going to see the focal plane. So it's very critical with focal plane shutters to be at a 60th or less, 30th, 15th, and so on. I'll go over shutter speeds in a minute. Okay, so you want to be at a 60th or less when you're working with a focal plane shutter with flash. So let's say, going back to our, what we're theorizing here is if I'm at ISO at 100 at a 60th of a second and the median, your, your camera meter is saying 5.6, now you've got to start making some mental calculations in your head. Is, is now 5.6 is going to render shallow depth of field. As you go up in scale to 90 is where you're going to get the most depth of field. And another thing to keep in mind as you're learning these calculations, lens selection plays in the depth of field as well meaning that the wider the lens, 20, compared to the longer lens, 180, which lens naturally, class, which one of these lenses naturally will yield, whether if they're both at 5.6, the most depth of field? The larger lens, sorry, I didn't. Um... Okay, say it again. Which like one the of these lenses, what did you say? Oh, just the larger of the two? Incorrect. So the, the why it's okay, that's why we're that's why I'm doing this review. The wider the angle of the lens, the more inherent depth of field. So if you're in a situation where you're worried because you're in low light, you're using a longer lens. If you have the opportunity to pull back in the environment, shoot with a longer lens, or I'm sorry, shoot with a, get closer to the subject, shoot with a wider angle lens, you're going to increase that inherent depth of field instead of being worried about being stuck at 5.6 with a 180 millimeter lens. You follow me? Put your thumbs up so I can see if you get that. That's very important. Okay. Now, if depth of field is a concern, 
with that 100 ISO at a 60th of a second. And I'm stuck here with this being my median exposure. Let's say you said to yourself, hell, I know what to do. I'm not going to change my lens. I'm just going to stop down two stops. So that would be 5.6 to 8 would be one stop. Come over to a, here to 11. That's two stops, right? That's a factor of two. So now I'm at F11. Guess what? Now with any lens, you're starting to increase depth of field. That we call that the sweet spot of depth of field. Once you're at 11 and moving up, you're starting to get more and more and more and more and more depth of field. Now, crucial historical point that you read about in foundations class uh, with Naomi Campbell's book, A World History of Photography, and even in Stone, London and Upton, the technical uh, textbook that I've issued to you for this class, if you read in the history section, chapter 18, you're going to learn about different schools of photography beginning in the uh, 19th century. So there were two distinct schools which should help you create this framework in your heads as to how you want a, your work to appear. They were called the pictorialists. And the street. They were, the straight school was also known as the F64 school, which should give you a clue. So if you were part of the F64 school of photography at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, and I looked at your work and I looked at a pictorialist work, I would understand your aesthetics for aperture selection. How? Pictorial school, they, live, they lived in this zone. Straight school of photography, they lived in this zone. The reason why they called their school F64, because most lenses made don't go all the way to F90. They're rare. Common if you use a really sophisticated view camera lens, expensive one, albeit, it's the, you're going to get F64. And that was their, that's where they started from. So we call that in our thinking, aperture pre preference. In digital photography, it's called uh, AV, uh, if you're using a Canon, aperture pre preference, as opposed to shutter preference or ISO preference. Now, also part of the aesthetic of the F64 school was low AS ISO, because you've learned the lower the ISO, the more real the picture looks, less grain. Silver halide, which is the light sensitive chemical used to expose the modern films that you use, as it gets more light sensitive, meaning the higher the ISO number, the, the halide gets bigger and bigger because it's getting penetrated by more light. So it starts to expand. That's what that grain is. So conversely, they designed the 100 ISO to keep that grain structure really tight, really low, so that the purest uh, pictorialists, I mean, the straight photographers would get a realistic looking picture. Now, the pictorialists, they would live in the, with the lenses that are 180 millimeters or longer, because the longer the lens is, the more limited depth of field you have. Does everyone kind of get that out of this stage? Okay. Okay, so one more visual, just so we have this cemented in our brains is this is your aperture at 1.4. This is your aperture at F90. Because we're viewing through a prism, 
at the maximum F number, the faster the lens, the easier it is to see through. Okay, so ISOs, 100, 200, 400, 800, 1600, 3200, 6400, 12,800. And on, and on and on. So this, so that this is really the first choice you're going to make as a photographer. Where do I want to be on this speed scale? I'll tell you a real quick story about how I made a very significant uh, ISO decision in my uh, in the, in the early 1990s. Prior to 1990s, from 1980 to roughly uh, 12 years later till 1992, I showed. Did you just raise your hand? Oh, uh, I shot mainly 100 speed film, and I mean I shot you know 200 speed film and I shot 400 speed film, but I really didn't find a need to go up higher on the scale because. Most of my clients wanted the image to be part of that stray school. They wanted a, a, a realistic rendition of what reality looked like. But in 1993, I, I hired a student out of school as my assistant. He went to RIT where I did my graduate studies. And he introduced me to a new film that Eastman Kodak was, had invented that he learned about when he was in Rochester called P3200. That's this number here, but it had a P in front of it. So that means process 3200. So we did some tests because he said, well, I was hearing from my professors, Tony, that 3200 looked like 400. I said, what, how could 3,200 look like 400? All those stops means the halide would get bigger and bigger. Well, not P3200. Kodak invented a new structure to their film that was more in the shape of a T than a circle. If to use letters rather than an O, it was now a T. So when that silver halide structure was invented, it enabled speeds to be exposed at 3200 process normally, and you would get essentially what a 400 ISO would look like. So that was a huge shift in how photographers speed the higher ISO. So what did I do? I had my technician push the film. From your foundation class, do you want, does anyone know the term or remember the term Professor Williams may have used in lab when you push or pull a film? Can anyone explain? Okay. So fundamentally, when you push the film, that means you're pushing it beyond the recommended limits of what the manufacturer of the film recommends. So I push the film one stop, two stops. I ran a test, 12,800 seconds. I said, I want to see how it holds up at that incredible speed. Because if I could get a result that I like, that meant I could virtually shoot in the dark almost and hand hold it. Because the other thing that we know about shutter speeds is once you get under a 60th of a second, not only does it relate to flash synchronicity, 
but it also relates to the camera shake. Once you're under a 60th of a second, that red warning at a 60th means if you go below that, you're going to get camera shake if you don't have the real steady hand or you're not braced somehow or you're not on a tripod. So if you're shooting at 12,800, you're at a, uh, at a 60th, you can imagine how low light that must be, right? So I did a two stop push, which meant if my uh, development time in the dark room, let's say it was eight minutes in the developer, I had to pull the development time. So it's push and pull. I had to pull the development time, let's say by two minutes. So I would develop the film at six minutes at let's say 75 degrees rather than eight minutes at 75 degrees. So if I had kept it steady at eight minutes, the recommended development time with 3,200 film, my film would have been overdeveloped and overexposed because I rated it two stops faster than what the manufacturer told me to rate it. This is another playground for creative photographers. How to experiment with film to create a unique look. So what happened in my case, once I did the experiment, and I'll bring some examples in of some of the early prints from this huge body of work I developed from 1990, I would say 1992 to around 2005, 13 years I worked almost exclusively as a 12,800 guy. And I became known all over the world for the technique because a couple of things converged at one time. A new technology emerged and I took advantage of it. And I pushed the film beyond what the what the manufacturer recommended because photographers at their core are alchemists, especially if you learn the foundational role that Silver Halide had in the development of the medium of photography. So because I came out of that early tradition of being a film photographer, didn't, have, didn't even know what, what was to emerge another decade later with the digital revolution, I was able to make a unique, distinctive, clearly defined look to my prints. People would say, oh, that's a Tony Ward print. I didn't even have to have my name on the print. So this is really part of the goal. And I'm gonna teach you other, this is called pre-production theory. And then there's post-production theory. Pre-production theory is when you're planning a shoot, executing a shoot. Well, the execution of, of the shoot is production. Pre-production is what I'm teaching you now. Post-production is what you do in the dark room to make your prints, again, even more distinctive through different things that you haven't learned yet in foundation from what I've, I've learned about the foundation class and how foundation is taught, like image masking, toning, things of that nature. Okay, another quick review on lenses. So there are two, three, essentially four, well, let's write them down. Lens groups. We have our wides, we have our normals, We have our telephotos. And there's one that I didn't go over yet. Can anyone tell me what, what lens that I'm, you're, you all are familiar with that I haven't discussed yet?
And you all, you're going to go, oh, man, I should have thought that as soon as I say. Zooms. Right? Thumbs up if you heard of a zoom lens before. Okay. So who would like to explain to me what a zoom lens is? Someone that has this. Abby, I, oh, Abby, I've heard from you. Rachel, I've heard from you. Uh, I'm going to go to you, Sharon. Can you explain what a zoom lens is? So basically, it's just one blend, but you you can like um have a like different lens. For example, you can have like 35 millimeters and 50 and like 85 on the same blend, on, and you don't have to change lens. Exactly. That's what a zoom lens is. So you, if you buy a zoom lens, sometimes it'll be like a 24 to 80. You know, and they have different manufacturers have different ranges. That's exactly right. Historically, however, professional photographers stayed away from zoom lenses until probably the turn of the century because with, with pro photographers, there's a, there's a technical exercise that they look to when they buy a lens or, or even for that matter, when they select a film, uh, a camera brand, and that's called bench testing. So when, when they are, when zoom lenses were tested on a bench in a lab, in an optical lab, they found that they weren't as sharp as any of these lens groups. Now, in your readings in, found, in foundation, you certainly should have learned the term that we use for any one of these other groups. What are they called? If it's not a zoom lens, what is it called? I'm gonna go out today and Fixed. buy, what? A fixed lens. Fixed focal length. Yep, that's that's one of the terms. Fixed. Yep. That was the term that we I was familiar with. Let's say it, you know in the seventies. Then it later developed into prime. Prime lenses really describes it well too, because they're primary to a specific point of view. Nowadays, zoom lens technology has skyrocketed. Uh, my DSLR camera actually has a zoom on it, and it, I have not had any problems with focus or sharpness or clarity. So I would say if you're working with a a zoom DSLR, you're fine. Won't have any uh, focus issues, clarity issues. It's pretty much the same. Okay, now I think we're ready to pivot. We went over all of the controllable factors at this point. And what's important to know about those controllable factors class, to reiterate again, if you arrive, again, I'm going to go to it, I'm going to shoot this room, right? I decided, okay, I'm going to shoot with 400 speed film. Right enough in here where I can probably handhold. So I, I wind up at a 60th of a second at F11. And all these, those three controllable factors are looking good to me in terms of all the things that we described. So all of these, this forms triangle for median exposure. Now let's just say I decided 
in this room that I wanted to have a person walking briskly through my shot as I, as I was making the picture because I wanted to do a whole series of pictures on human beings in motion, okay? Which reminds me, again, when Foundation, when you read about Edward Mybridge, for example, who was the famous 19th century photographer um, that actually took some of his motion studies at Penn. He worked with the figure moving, but the figure was always stopped action. So he wanted to make sure he had a fast shutter speed. So he, he did, there was no flash photography then. So he shot always out in the open light or in a studio with skylights where he could get that shutter speed up, probably manipulated his film to be as high as ISO as you could back in those days, and then dealt with the F number accordingly. F number would have been the least important controllable factor over these two. So this is the golden triangle of creating a median exposure within the realm of how you want to shoot. So if I wanted to change this, these values, and I wanted to have a person walking through this scene, with, but the person is in motion, so what do I have to go to? Can't go to F11, that's not going to create motion. Can't go to ISO, that's not going to create motion. Controllable factor that creates motion is shutter speed. So we know that if we go down to 30th, 15, 8, quarter, half, things get slower and slower. So you would run a test, which is going to lead to my next thing. I just want to write this down. So you would run a you would want to run a test as to which shutter speed works best for this. That's an aesthetic decision. That's why we do pre-production testing when we're working on assignment three. Pre-production testing will help you arrive at a creative problem to solve, but you don't do it on the day of the shoot. This is where you have to test. So let's say that I want to interchange this number to here. So that would be 15, 30, 60. How many stops is that? Anyone? 15 to a 60. What's the stop differential? Factor of two. Two stops. Look, one stop, two stops, right? One, two. These are the types of questions you get on an exam. Okay, so if I'm going to make a two stop adjustment, ISO stays the same. What has to change? What would this F number have to be changed to for this to work to arrive back at that median exposure? Anyone? Come on, you guys know this. No, just went over the scale. 16, 22, 32. If I go two stops this way, I gotta stop down two stops this way to arrive back here. Now do you get it? Thumbs up, please. Okay. Now, as you're starting to understand how to work within the context of these controllable factors, when you start testing your film, which should be this week, you have your cameras, no reason to not start testing your film. You already know what your first assignment is, your 35, your 36 uh, exposure rule, right? Now, when you do that first assignment, are you really going to go into the assignment without doing any? You're just going to trust that need, meter and all that? No. You start testing to make sure the meter's accurate. You start testing to make sure you know how to focus. You start testing. Test, test, test. That's what we do in pre-production. In production, 
Now you know where you, what you aesthetic you like and where, how you're going to proceed to be unique in, in, the, uh, in the way that you illustrate the assignment. So I want you to learn this now. It's a technique called bracketing. I want you to do a bracket test this week. Bracket test. Here's how you do it. You got 36 exposures on your roll of film. Load the film. You're at film, you're at uh, frame one. So this is your film strip. All the way down. Frame one. Frame two, frame three, frame four, frame five, frame six. You've got six frames here. Normally, I do a five step bracket. Most camera meters are never off by more than a stop, unless the, unless the meter is broken completely. So, if you do a five step bracket, what that means is that first frame, this is going to be what your meter tells you. Let's say the meter, you're at 100 ISO, you're at 125 on your shutter, and the meter says, oh, this should be at F16. Stop the lens, you stop the lens down to F16, click, that's frame one. Frame two, we want to go a stop overexposed. So what would the F number be if we want to go a half a stop overexposed? Or let's let's make it full stops. What would it be? If, if it's 16 and I want to make it one stop brighter, factor of two, what would this number be, class? Anyone? Yeah. 8 F 8 Look, look at your notes. F11. Correct. Okay, so that's one stop. So if we want to make it two stops overexposed, then we go to F8. If we want to make it one stop underexposed, what would frame? Four bit. If you started at sixteen, anyone? Thirty-two. Uh, 32? Almost. Look at your notes. Twenty-two. Correct. And then the last one would be what? Thirty-two. This is called a one, two, three, four, five-step bracket. Median exposure, two stops under, two stops over. You're going to get something on that film. You follow? Now, that could be the first bracket. When I bracket, I generally don't go full two stops. I go half-stop increments. So rather than uh, sixteen, I'll go. 16 and a half, and then 22, and then go the other way. Now I'm getting confused. So two stops, yeah, so the half stop increments would be eight and a half and 11 and a half. So you don't have to go all the way five, five stops, you could go half stop increments. And some lenses, by the way, have half stop increments on the, uh, on the aperture dial. Like my Hasselblad, you'll hear it click. Maybe, maybe, maybe something earlier, my gosh, but you, really, you have to visually check it if you want to do a half stop. But for learning, do a full stop. And then 
when we process this film in lab, we're going to we're going to definitely have something to print with. And then here's another important thing: since this is a color class, now I'm going to start teaching about the difference between color film and black and white film right now. Color film, when you process it and go into a dark room to print it, there's one big distinction. And this is what I want to teach you about the distinction. I always want you to err on the side of overexposure. It's better to overexpose than to underexpose. Because class, if you're underexposed, you may have you may have a latent image that's printable in the highlights, but you won't have anything printable in the shadows. That's why median exposure is critical. But if you're underexposed, there's nothing there because it didn't you didn't have enough light f-stop number of shutter speed to get enough of a latent image in the shadows to make it printable. However, if you're overexposed, you can pull the film, which slows the development time down, limits the time of development, or you learn this in foundation class, if you have an overexposed negative and you make a print, oh, my shadows look beautiful, there's I, I shot a big tree and underneath the tree there was a shadow and I saw, you know, on the ground, all the detail in the grass from the, you know, even though it was in shade and all the bark of the tree and anything dark in the print was there. But in the highlights on the overexposed negative, my clouds, oh, what happened to the cloud? All I see is white, right? You've seen that in, if you printed black and white pictures before. So from your foundation class, when you had an overexposed black and white negative, what did you do to compensate for the highlights in that overexposed negative? Anyone raise your hand. Yes. You don't? Close, just the opposite, you burn. So oh, burn, yes. okay? So if you have an overexposure in the highlights, you give more time you give more light to that area that needs it. And conversely, in the situation of underexposure, there's sometimes in an underexposed negative the ability to dodge, because if you expose it to too much light, it's so underexposed that you might, it might go to black and there won't be any detail in there, right? You've had that experience when you're in lab. Here's the difference between negative printing, black and white, and negative printing, which is what you're going to be doing for this class. You don't have that much latitude. This is an issue of latitude, class. In black and white film photography, that's why we start you there. Because this film is forgiving. There's a lot of latitude. A lot of black and white negatives are printable. But color, different ball game. You have to be much more accurate that's why I'm teaching you now to err on the side of overexposure. Here's why. Well, I just explained reason one. Here's reason two. You also learned in foundation class when you were printing that negative. You went in the dark room, you got your paper out, got the negative up in the in larger camera. What other tool? Well, I'm going to just say, you were, you were taught to use certain filters in black and white, right? In the dark, remember that? Raise your hand if you remember the filters. Okay. Aliana. So Aliana, so you're in the dark room, you're getting ready to pull the filters, right? So how many filters were in there, in the pack? Uh, what do you remember about the use of the filters? 
Um, that they can either increase or decrease the contrast. Exactly. Now let's hold that point. She said you could increase or decrease the contrast by using a filter. Okay. Here, I'll just write it down here. So in black and white, you had filters from one to five. You had five, and, and some of the packs had half, half, uh, half filter increments, right? You could use a one and a half or a two. So a one would, would yield the least amount of contrast correction. A five would dramatically increase the contrast of your print. In color photography class, there are no filters, none. Because you're using a di what's called a dichroic head compared to a condenser and larger. So it's different types of light transmission. In color photography, the light transmission to a dichroic head is very even, which is crucial to working with any enlarger, but it's also very flat. The light is very flat, it's not harsh. In the black and white dark rooms, we're using <coughs> convex glass that looks like this. Light source is up here. Light shines through the convex glass, spreads out evenly, perfectly evenly to expose your negative onto the paper. So it's the actual technology the invention of enlarger apparatus that makes the distinction of exposing for color negatives much different than exposing for black and white negatives. Does everyone thumbs up if you kind of get that framework right now? Okay. Oh man, I'm looking outside and it's snowing again. I don't want to spend the night here. So let's now jump over. to the DSLR. Because as, as I start teaching you about color, this class is designed so that for assignment one, which is our sequential portrait, is required to be shot on film. But the other two assignments, it's optional whether you stay with your film camera or you switch over to a DSLR. Raise your hands if you already have a DSLR handy for the option of shooting. Okay, anyone else? Let me get a little closer here because I didn't see any other, only uh, Eliana raised her hand. No one else has a DSLR? I'm missing somebody who's not in my frame. Oh, hi, Ellie. Oh, there's Abby, okay. All right, so, so does that mean that Sharon, Rachel, and Abby are gonna just be shooting film the whole class? Or are you gonna- I think Dan said that there was one DSLR that we could borrow. Okay, so, yeah, now some, some students already at a 200 level want to shoot film. And there's, by the way, there's a huge uh, resurgence to shooting film, by the way, especially, uh, you know, college students, young millennials and such. So uh, I don't have a problem if you shoot everything uh, in, in, uh, on film. 
but you do have the option of, of using a DSLR. You can get DSLR cameras uh, relatively inexpensively on eBay or some other means. If we only have one for a loaner, that's, that's gonna be problematic. But I just wanna go over a few things about the DSLR that makes it distinctly different than an SLR. One of the things that they invented when they created the DSLR class is image stabilization. There, all the lenses that we've gone over uh, today so far, there's no image stabilization on the lens, okay? So image stabilization is, is controlled by the use of shooting at the proper shutter speed or being on a tripod. But as the technology of photography has begun to expand and the scientists worked on other methods, they came up with the stabilizer button that you switch on that helps, has, there must be some kind of gyroscopic computation that happens when you take a picture in low light or under a 60th of a second that helps you keep your image more sharp to reduce camera shake. That's number one. So with my DSLR, I always keep that on because I like the fact that I can shoot under a 60th of a second without the worry that I used to have um, with my film camera. The other big thing that became like the number one seller leading up to today with respect to DSLRs is megapixel count. So what they did is they essentially transfer an electrical charge from the lens to a computer in a let an electrical charge and the term was uh, what's the uh, mathematics where it's X's and O's? What's the mathematical term when you're using X's and O's? Coordinates. And what is it? Coordinates. Ordinance is binary. What is it? Binary. That's it. So they. So I think that's ones and zeros. Is it, is it ones and zeros? I think so. Okay. So they use binary computations to create the grain, which we call in digital photography what? What's the term? What's the new terminology? transferring from a film camera to let's say an ISO 1000. What's the term we use? We don't use grain because there's no film. Noise. So the electrical charge using this binary formula created noise on a media card. Could be an SD card, could be a flash drive, which replaced our traditional use of film. There are other advantages, not many more as significant as the first two I mentioned with stabilization and you know, being able to shoot more without paying for film was a big plus. But there's a, there's a lot of people out there that think that that binary transformation didn't ever match or come close to the aesthetic look of silver alloy, okay? So I think that's part of the reason why a lot of students are switching over to film these days. Now, the next thing we need to know about color fill is color temperature. So the first significant thing I explained to you is that color film and color processing and color printing one has to be much more accurate, erroring in the side, side, uh, side of overexposure rather than underexposure because you don't have those contrast controls in the dark room that you once had in black and white. The other big issue is the issue of color temperature. So for example, daylight. Color temperature is 50. 200 Kelvin. Tungsten light. Is 
is 2,800 Kelvin. Tungsten light is the light that you normally use with an incandescent bulb, right? Like the bulb you use next to your bedside that's kind of warm, has a yellowish cast to it. That's tungsten light. It's also known as incandescent. These terms are interchangeable. Daylight is also can be referred to ambient light, which is generally ambient light. When I use the term ambient light, that's usually a mix of daylight and tungsten, right? Ambient light. And that could be an ambient reading of 3200 because it's it's in between daylight and tungsten Kelvin. The color temperature, color is measured by Kelvin, okay? So before we had the invention of digital cameras, the way we learned to get the proper color temperature for a scene was we used what's called a color temperature meter. So this is a color temperature meter. So the light would hit this white disc and it would give you a reading. In this case, I just took a reading by pushing this button and the reading comes up to 3520. That's the color temperature of this room because that's the combination of the light coming in from outside mixed with these overhead fluorescents, which tend to be a lower color temperature. And with fluorescent lighting, there's cool white fluorescence and warm white fluorescence. So if you don't know how to filter for that, your color film is going to look like hell. So what do we do? All right, so if you're using a color temperature meter and you're, uh, we I believe we have one here at school. I'm, well, I'll keep this here at school as well if you want to borrow it. I will loan it to you. You just have to uh, hit me up in advance so I can get it to you somehow. I'll leave it with Dan in the office or something. But once I press for the color temperature, now mind you, before you press to find out what the color temperature is, the color temperature has to be told what type of film it has. So I have mine preset for daylight film rather than tungsten film. There's two types of film you can get for color photography, it's only two, color, uh, daylight, or tungsten. So I have daylight registered in here because that's what presumably I would have in my camera. And then I would push on these buttons. LB is light balance. There's two types of filters you use, light balance and color compensation. So the LB correction would be minus 102, and the CC correction in this room is plus eight. Then I would look on the back of my balancing index, which is, looks like this. And then I would look for those numbers, and then it would tell me, oh, light balance, you need an 82A filter, and your CC compensation, you need a magenta filter. So then I would pull those filters from my camera bag, place them over the front of my lens in a filter holder, which you can get at any camera store. I have one here, but I, I don't want to take the time to look for that now. And then you would slide the filters from the color temperature meter over the front of the lens and then take your picture. That's how we get an incredibly accurate rendition of what the scene actually looks like. Now, I know this is all getting, you know, color gets a lot more complicated than black and white. The other thing that one can do is just shoot it straight. But I would venture to recommend if you know you're going to be shooting indoors and you know that there's no available light and you're using incandescent lights which we have to to loan you 
then I would get tungsten film. If you're shooting outdoors, you switch over to daylight. You don't really have to filter. If you're shooting outdoors, like on a overcast day, your film will start, your, your pictures will look a little bluer than normal, which is easily correctable when you're in lab. So color temperature is very critical to learning about color photography and generally, but there are ways to manage, not contrast so much, but the actual way your color looks. When I taught the color class last year, uh, most of my students were uh, shooting in such a way that we did most of our corrections in lab using uh, print the same compensation principles as I do in camera, but we, we use them in the lab. So there's another way around it so that you don't have to invest in color compensation filters and getting into all those critical adjustments. Any questions about color temperature or any of that right now? Just let that kind of soak in. And of course, you should be reading the technical um, textbook that I issued, Stone and Luck, London and Upton, up and they go over that in great detail. Oh, uh, one of the other advantages while I'm looking at my notes about the digital cameras that I didn't have the luxury of with analog cameras is that I think almost all digital cameras now when you buy it have a little knob here on the, and you see this little knob here, it, it turns left or right. This is your eye adjustment diopter. A lot of students don't use it or weren't told or taught what it is. But if, for example, if you wear glasses and you want to view through your DSLR and you, you're, you know, you're using your autofocus, which most DSLRs have autofocus now, we're using manual cameras. So we're learning how to manually focus. But with my DSLR, the auto autofocus in these cameras is amazing. So I use my AF as opposed to uh, MF, which is manual function. So that's a little button right here, AF or manual. I do like the, Canon was known to have amazing uh, auto function, functionality um, when they came out with digital cameras back in the uh, turn of the century. And a lot of sports photographers gravitated toward Canon because they thought auto functionality was better than Nikon. I'm sure they're pretty much the same now, although some might argue one way or the other. But when you're viewing through the DSLR and you use your auto functionality and everything still looks blurred, that's because you don't have, you either need glasses or are wearing glasses. And if you're wearing glasses and your image, even though you focus it, is still blurry, it's because the diapter adjustment has to be made so you can focus your eyeglasses to the prism. You got me? Okay, that's very important. Another thing about digital cameras is the megapixel cam. So my little Canon 20D, which I bought 15 years ago, has eight megapixels. Eight megapixels. So what that means is at that point in time with this price value, eight megapixels was the minimum amount of megapixels I needed to make an exposure and a print that I would find satisfactory compared to shooting with a uh, 35 millimeter film camera, 100 ISO, 100 ISO and making an eight by 10 print. So at, at eight megapixels, I'm able to make an eight by 10 inch print 
with no problem, without seeing a phenomenon called pixelation. Pixelation is a problem where you literally start to see the pixels, which is the binary electrical charge that's devised by the engineers to, to replace silver halide to re render a light sensitive image on a media card, okay? So <clears throat> digital manufacturers want to avoid pixelation at all, all costs. So as the years go by, you start seeing cameras that have 20 megapixels and up. The camera I'm using now, I'll show you. As I've gotten older, I've gotten more into gadgets that minimize my need to lug a lot of equipment around. So this is the camera I can use for professional assignments now. This is a Sony mirrorless. This particular model is the RX105. I bought it in 2018. I paid about $1,000 for it. It's a 22 megapixel camera. Unbelievable. So it has a huge amount of capacity to create a lot of detail on my media card. But here's the key. This is the reason why class, I don't want you to be disillusioned by, oh, I only have a 10 megapixel camera. I still use my 20D as often as I use this. But this is the difference. When you start to go up in size, 11 by 14, print size I'm talking about, 16 by 20. And 20 by 24. These are classic print sizes. In other words, you can buy, you can buy photographic paper in any of these sizes, okay? Either for analog photography or digital. As you go up in size, if you, an eight megapixel file will not make as good a quality print at 16 foot by 20 as it will eight by 10. So you only need the pixel count when you start to enlarge. If you're only using your digital camera for the internet, which has a low DPI dots per inch, then a cell phone is adequate. But if you start to make exhibition prints, and if you start to enlarge your prints and display your prints and create fine art prints, then that megapixel count plays into your decision making in terms of the type of equipment um, that you that you want to use. When you're loading a media card. This one is, it has the old fashioned flash drive. Um, the new camera, my Sony mirrorless camera. And what, my, what I mean by mirrorless is that Sony was one of the first, if not the first camera ma manufacturer to make a camera that doesn't have a mirror in it. So what that means is that's the mirror. Can you see? So, the, so with, so when the lens is on here, the, the light goes through the lens at your selected F number, bounces off that mirror, goes up through the prism, the prism inverts the image so you can see it properly. Now, the slower the shutter speeds and that mirror bouncing up and down to get out of the way to expose the film. See, this mirror moves when you're shooting at a certain rate of speed, depending on your shutter speed. So what Sony said is, if we could skip this step and make the camera mirrorless, then we're gonna get more consumers interested in buying our product because the worst thing that a person I can't answer, I'm, I'll call you back, I'm in class right now, see you. Sorry about that. 
So the, so Sony came up with this mirrorless technology to enable us to shoot in slower shutter speeds and to minimize that camera shape. So these media cards uh, go up to like 30 gigs or higher. Uh, I only have like a, a two gigabyte card in here because at eight megapixels, you're not using that much space even on a two gig card, right? So you need to have a thousand megabytes to, to render this, well actually 2000 megabytes to, to use all the pictures on this card. So I could take a lot more pictures with a, a, an eight megapixel camera than a 25 or higher megapixel camera. So that's another thing to consider when you're shooting digital color photography. And whenever I load my media card in the camera, the first thing you do is format it. And there's a, every camera has a, in your manual, uh, a uh, instruction on how to format. And what format means is that with digital capture, if you're using that card over and over again, and you're erasing the files, and then you're putting, you want to start new, you can get what they refer to as ghosting on your card. In other words, it doesn't completely erase the image. I've had that happen one or two times, but I always get in the habit of formatting the card. And that way you won't have the problem inherent with uh, digital capture. What else? One of the other advantages that digital cameras have over analog cameras is the capture modes. So on my DSLR, again, getting back to our rudiments from the beginning of the session today, what do we start with first? Anyone can tell me when I'm getting ready to do an assignment, what do I set first? ISO. ISO. So let's say I set my ISO at 400. So I set the ISO on the, on the digital camera as my first entry point. Then I have a couple of options. These are modern options, I would say. And with the Canon system, I can shoot in manual, which is what you're learning to shoot in in the analog photography section of the class. And then I have a dial that says A, B. And on the, on the lesson plan, you can see under 35 millimeter cameras, the DSLR capture modes are T, B, and A, B. I don't know why it's not called S, P, and A, P, because what those priorities mean with cannons. And this gets to the, this speaks to the point of when you're using cameras automatically, they can get you into trouble real fast if you don't know how to use a camera manually. So if I set my ISO on my DSLR at 100, and I use this TV priority, shutter priority both, remember this is our triangle for our controllable factors. So shutter's over here, Aperture's over here. All, all three are interrelated. Can, Canon says that I can prioritize my shutter. Okay. So what that what that's what I would probably, if I'm going to shoot uh, automatically or with any of these priorities, if I get beyond that manual, like I'm going to set this, I'm going to set that, like I showed you earlier. Shutter priority makes sense with a DSLR if you know you're not, you don't have a tripod with you, you know you're going to fall under a 16th of a second at 100. Most indoor set, uh, situations, you will. You're going to need at 100, you're going to need a tripod. So I'm going to priority set to a 60th because I know that's the limit to which I can hand hold. So this is called in Canon terminology, a TV priority or shutter priority. And then what that will do when I go to take my meter reading, it will tell me what my aperture is. So let's say it tells me my aperture is at 11. So that's how you handle controllable factors with automatic functionality. 
you prioritize one or the other. Conversely, if I'm shooting a landscape and I want to get everything in focus from the foreground to infinity, you've learned today that I have to pick maximum aperture because maximum aperture maximizes depth of field, right? So, so if I prioritize using the aperture priority, that is AB, by AB, I don't know. And then I would select, if it can go to, down to 45 or more, you would prioritize aperture, and then it would tell you what the shutter is. Now, the problem is, in this situation, since you're not using your brain, you're using the computation of a computer, computer may say 1 15th of a second, and I don't have a tripod, but, and you're not listening to your brain, you're listening to the computation of the computer, you take the shot at a 15th of a second, you've got excellent depth of field, you start to look at your files, maybe you didn't look at the back of your uh, digital camera to see what your preview looked like, it, and, or maybe it was a subtle camera shape, and in a 15th, you have a problem. This is why I train you to think on your feet rather than to use the technology that is available to you at a 200 level place. And I'm kind of encouraged that, you know, it looks like my three out of four of you don't even have a DSLR at this point. So it looks like you're going to be married to analog. After this brief, this review today, if any of you uh, do want to transition after assignment one into uh, a DSLR, talk to me. You know, maybe I can loan you my camera for the assignment or Dan or don't, don't, not, don't not pursue it because you don't have it readily available is what I'm saying. Because I, I would like for you to have, you know, the experience of both because we will be, we will be uh, working in lab on how to make digital prints. We will be working in lab. I asked you on day one to get Photoshop installed on your personal laptops. You know, we will, you know, we will be doing Photoshop. I'll show you a lot of the tools I've used over the years. I've, I've mastered a lot of the tools and I use those tools in my work and they are amazing. I mean, it's no question, but at, but at the core, we, we we're in two different worlds. Analog and digital are two different worlds, and you're in, at this 200 level going to be introduced to both of them. So it's quarter to 12. Let's see what else I can quickly review. Oh, yeah. So, all right. Oh, another important thing that's very good about digital photography. Remember how I was going over, you know, the use of this for analog, the light, the color temperature meeting, reading. So the scientist that involved, invented digital photography came up, up with a term called AWV. <laughs> what this means is AWV is a setting on a DSLR that it provides you with automatic white balance. With emphasis on white. White being the absence of color. So the, the AW calculation will pick up any white that's in your picture, make a computation through its computer and automatically give you color compensation and light balancing corrections that my Minolta hand meter used to do. It's an incredible invention, incredibly useful to use AWB automatic white balance when we're using a digital camera, because that gets around the need to filter. Uh, it, it actually 
can even calculate the difference between 5,500 daylight tills and 2,800. Although I don't advise this, if you're using a digital camera and you know you're shooting in daylight, then you should set the camera to its daylight functionality. Don't let your uh, AWB overwork because I've seen examples where it doesn't calculate accurately with that when you're that far off. It's, re it's, it's mainly designed to calculate when you're at least putting in the right context of the color temperature of the environment you're working. That makes the computer work a little less hard and it limits its inaccuracy. When we meet next week, I will show you how to set up a tripod and use it properly. Oh, the other terminology that's often referred to in digital photography. Now that you have an understanding of those controllable factors in my analog lecture is the nature of a histogram. So you will see in the textbook, these histograms, which essentially measures tonality, okay? The computation in your histogram reading on your digital ca camera measures tonality. So it will tell you whether the image is too dark or too light depending on how that histogram reads. So same theory is true with digital capture. If it's too light, if that histogram is clumping up to the right side of the graph, that means a phenomenon called clipping is taking place. You'll, you'll read that terminology in the textbook, the technical read I uh, started up that clipping means that it's overblown, it's too bright, way too bright, no detail. And even it's true in color printing, we do have the luxury of dodging and burning. Dodging and burning is a way to minimize the clipping or minimize under exposure, but it's better to control it with the accuracy of proper metering. So that's the, that's the technological term for uh, histogram when, it, when we're thinking digital capture. Oh, one more critical thing. And I think we'll be done for the day. Lens care. Lens care. Very important to keep your caps on, which I noticed when you were showing me your cameras earlier today uh, to protect that front, front lens element. If you were to get a fingerprint on the fr front lens element or a piece of food or something in your apartment, animals are notorious for being you know, dander and dirt. Uh, cat hairs, gets on the front lens element, could be a problem. Could make the image soft because it's diffracting the light entering the front lens element. Now, what makes it worse, you get those same Mars on the rear lens element, especially a fingerprint, especially hair. Since the rear lens element is so close to the film plane, it's like a one-to-one -one transfer to the film. Whereas it's a little bit more diffuse going from the front lens element through all the lens, uh, through all the glass in the lens to the rear lens element to the film plane. So it's critically important to make sure rear uh, lens element is clean. Uh, there are lens cleaners that you can get at camera supply. There are also anti-static cloths with, which are kind of orange, they come in a bag and they pull uh, dust and dirt off of your lenses. 
but yeah, make, make sure that uh, rear, rear and front lens elements are clean and that way we'll avert any problems uh, moving forward. Now, just very quickly, uh, just to outline next week. So next week we're going to pair up and we're going to, I'm going to teach you the fundamentals of lighting for portraiture. Uh, you can see over here and you see all those different lights. Yeah, that's what I'm going to be teaching you about next week. Uh, tungsten lights, daylight balance lights. By the way, I didn't point out on the board that strobe lights are also 5,500K. They're measured in the same Kelvin temperature as daylight. So that's 5,500K. Uh, so we'll, I'm going to show you, you know, how to light, the essentials of lighting. And also, you know, each week I give you those chapter readings. Please, please, please stay up on those readings. I, uh, I think it's so important to understand like my language. I can tell today, you know, I'm going over stuff again and again. I'm hoping that you get it. I know you're smart young people, but unless you get that foundation down in, in terms of the technology and th these chapter readings will help you with that. So stay up on the readings and uh, make sure you bring some film to class for next week's session. Just the roll or two will do. You might. Okay, very quickly, this just going to go around uh, while we have a few more minutes. Abby, do you know what who the subject of your portrait is going to be yet? Um, I have an I someone in mind, but I haven't asked them yet. Okay, and I sent you samples on model releases. Yes. Okay, now you can do self portraits too. I, I want to include that. And here's another name out of photographic history. Cindy Sherman is a fam very famous artist who does exclusively self-portraits. So Google her and look at Cindy's history and see some of the remarkable work that she's done as a self-portraitist to give you a little inspiration, especially when you're dealing with the complexity of si assignment one. I think that might serve you well. Rachel, how about yourself? Um, I'm between two people. Like I've thought of both of them. I haven't asked them specifically. I've started shooting a little bit, but nothing that I like think is that great. Um, okay, so you've already started and now you've been shooting outdoors or what type of lighting, light source? It was at night, so I don't have high hopes for it. <laughs> um, available light at night? What? Available light at night? And yeah, light? and indoors both. Okay. All right, so next week you're gonna learn how to add some auxiliary lighting to that scene to help you. Yeah, um, it wasn't like fixed. It was like, we were just out. So I, was, so I just brought my camera. It wasn't like a session. And what ISO did you use? 400. And which film, so the class knows? Was it um, a Kodak film or? A Fuji film. A Fuji film, okay. Uh, and how about you, Sharon? Um, I haven't started on assignment one, but I was shooting because I had a role in my film camera, so I had to finish that. It was a black and white film, so I was like shooting a little bit in the snow, like with my friends. And yeah. Okay, and Aliana, do you know who the subject of your assignment one is going to be? I have a few ideas, but I'm not entirely sure yet. Okay. All right, uh, I think that concludes the, today's session. If there aren't any other questions, we're gonna be meeting in person next week. Social distancing, of course, I'll spread out the tables in the classroom so we can keep apart. And I look forward to finally uh, meeting all of you in person, masked up and ready to go next week. If you have any questions during the coming week, uh, feel free to send me uh, an email to my Haverford account or my personal account. Uh, if any of you have exposed film, I would recommend that you get it processed between now and next week's class. If it's color film, I gave you a list of labs. And if it's black and white, uh, those same labs, rep labs run black and white as well. That'll give you a jump start. That way I can look at your film. And if you've done, I, I don't think you did any bracketing, but if you made notes on what those exposures were, then you can get a head start in knowing what your, how your meter is metering is working and how the camera is functioning. Okay, until we meet next week, thank you for your 
time and your attentiveness and I look forward to meeting you. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you, Ellie. And I'll see you next week. Did you want us, sorry, did you want us to bring the, our cameras in next week or no? Yes, absolutely bring your cameras to class. Yes. Thank you. Okay. See ya. Because we're, we're going to be actually shooting next week. We're shooting Thank in you. class. Okay. Thank you.